two 14-year-old best friends are dropped off at school on a cold February day, but they decide not to go in. Skipping school was not new for either Angela Reader or Tammy Akers, and this day was likely supposed to be like many others in which they hung out and did anything other than wasting their day in school. But even after the final bell rang, there was no sign of the pair. They didn't return home that day, or the day after that. In fact, neither teenager has been seen since that day in 1977. While the teens were initially written off as runaways, now 44 years after their disappearance, the investigation indicates that something much worse happened to the two girls, and a sexual predator and murderer may be at the center of it all. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Angela Rader and Tammy Akers. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. is the oldest one we've covered. Yeah, by far. Yeah, and the second in which two people disappeared together. Yeah, that's uh, it, that took me by surprise when you said that. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And it's another semi-local story as it took place right here in Virginia. Oh, where? Um, down in Roanoke, okay. which I actually, I used to live there. And it's a case that takes twists and turns over the course of decades and does seem extremely solvable. So I'm really hoping that continuing to get Tammy and Angela's stories out there can help in some way. Because, I mean, I had never heard of this case before. Yeah, and I. like I said, like I used to live in Roanoke. Uh, several of the, the reports that I mentioned throughout this um, are from WDBJ, where my friend Susan worked. <laughs> like, I just, I had no idea about this. I actually found out about it by accident when I was researching last week's case on Christopher Lewis. Last year, I think it was, Nick Mech put out a 25th anniversary of um, Runaway Train. Oh, Remember? Yeah. 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 So um, for those of you who are not 100 years old like we are, that was a very <laughs> popular song in the early 90s by the band Soul Asylum that um, at the time, the original video featured like all these missing posters of, you know, children, right. many of whom were runaways. And it actually led to several of the kids in the videos being found and eventually coming home. Yeah. So for the 25th anniversary, Nick Mech, like had a bunch of artists uh, redo the song. And then what's really cool, because like we're in 2021 technology or 2020, whenever it was, it's online. And when you go to it, they'll show posters of kids who are missing in your area. Oh. Yeah. That's really so it cool. like showed all of these Virginia kids. Yeah. And then I just noticed there's this black and white photo. Yeah. And it said, you know, Angela Rader missing from Roanoke, Virginia. I was like, oh, that's crazy. So I dug into it a little bit and then I saw that not only was it from 1977, but that she had gone missing with her friend, Tammy Akers. So that really kind of led me to all of this. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it makes sense that you wouldn't hear about it. It's, you said it's 44 years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, digging into cold case files is, is not new, but the general public having knowledge about cold case files yeah. and investigations is kind of new. Uh, yeah. And there's, and there's definitely like, been a recent uptick in emphasis on that mm -hmm. uh, within police departments. So, uh, you know, it's not surprising that when you were living there in when the, I was 23 in the early 2000s, or whatever, yeah, that, <laughs> you know, that, yeah, that you wouldn't know anything about that. And it probably didn't get a whole lot of uh, 
media coverage at the time. No, and it didn't. But what's interesting is it did get media coverage a little bit before that and very recently. So we'll get to all that, but let's dive in. Angela May Rader was born on July 30th, 1962, and Tammy Lynn Akers was just a month older. She was born on June 28th, 1962. Despite the fact that both girls attended William Ruffner Junior High in Roanoke, Virginia, that isn't actually where they went. According to Tammy's older sister, Linda Owens, who runs a blog about her sister's disappearance, as well as the Missing Tammy Lynn Akers Facebook page, the girls actually met at Coiner Springs Juvenile Center. Mm. Mm-hmm. Tammy was there for truancy, um, but Linda isn't sure why Angela was sent to the center. But the girls took a liking to each other and exchanged addresses and phone numbers and, you know, got really excited when they found out they went to the same school. So once they were back home, the pair became fast friends. Because of her sister's blog, I know a lot more about Tammy's childhood than I do about Angela's. Tammy was the youngest of four children and didn't come from a very stable home. Originally from West Virginia, the family moved to Roanoke in 1960. Linda believes that this move was in part a decision by her father to isolate the family from extended family members. The household was abusive, and Linda characterizes her father as an alcoholic who couldn't keep a job, so the Acre children's childhood was marked by instability, poverty, and abuse. Tammy's parents eventually divorced, but their mom remarried, and according to Linda, the abuse continued. As Tammy grew up, she started to have behavioral issues. She hated school, as you could probably tell from her truancy. Uh, I mean, who likes school at that age? It, yeah, exactly. And, you know, it sounds like she just got into a lot of kind of low-level teenage trouble. Mm-hmm. You know, she was like running around again and and skipping school and, and things like that, but... It, According to Linda, I mean, she she wasn't out of control or mm-hmm. anything like that. Like, she definitely had behavioral issues, but, you know, she said she was still a sweet girl and, you know, always very kind and everything. She just didn't like school and, you know, came from an environment that didn't have a lot of rules and structure. I mean, I came from an environment that did have a lot of rules and structure. and You were still bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I skipped school so much more than my parents now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hopefully they don't listen to this. <laughs> I don't want well, you getting in trouble. Well, I'm 40 now, so I mean, well, what, what are they going to do? I don't know, but I don't, I don't want Ava mad at either of us. <laughs> <laughs> when the girls disappeared, I mentioned that they were written off as runaways. It sounds like the prevailing theory was that the girls basically thought they were grown-ups and just took off, which was fine. Like, I don't know. It was 1977, though, so, I mean, I guess that belief is a little as shocking to me than our last case, you know, which is Christopher Lewis, who was written off as a runaway when he was 13 in 2014. I mean, yeah, I guess it's the 70s, but it's still... No, it's, they're still 14. Right, and like, it still seems eerily convenient for law enforcement to just say, well, they have these truancy issues, so they must have been runaways. Or even if they had a history of running away, like, oh, well, they ran away. There's well, they did. And 14 year old girls. Bah. Exactly. Like, that, like that's just, the part where it's like, oh, they ran away before. So I honestly, I do get it at first because as I get to like, even their families were like, oh, whatever, they'll be back. But obviously they weren't. Yeah. As days pass. Yeah. And then, you know, the police still didn't really kick into gear. So we'll get into all of that later. But, you know, going back to the time when they actually ran away, right? So these two girls are 14. Linda, Tammy's sister, disagrees with, you know, this characterization in general. Like, she doesn't say that Tammy thought she was a grown-up, you know? She says in her blog, quote, Tammy was not in a hurry to grow up. All she ever wanted was a normal, loving home. What she couldn't understand or accept was the fact that our family didn't do normal. It was dysfunctional, and acts of kindness or love were often seen as weaknesses, end quote. And Tammy was also afraid of the dark and like, actually slept in bed with Linda until Linda got married and left home, which was about a year prior to uh, Tammy's disappearance. 
Now, there are a few more things that I want to bring up about the Akers family that I think are important in terms of the circumstances around the girl's disappearance. Tammy's parents were married when Tammy's father was 31 and her mother was just 14. Mm. Yeah. Now, Tammy's mother, Helen's parents had to sign off on this marriage, which they did. And um, West Virginia in the 60s, you said, right? Yeah, in the 50s. 50s. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. That, that was pretty common. Yeah. And so they got married when she was 14. And then Helen had four children back to back to back to back, starting at the age of 16. So from 16 to 21, she just had four babies. Okay. Yeah. So there's that. And then, you know, when I just mentioned that Linda, um, Tammy's older sister, left left home and got married about a year before Tammy disappeared. Well, Linda wasn't that much older than Tammy. She got pregnant when she was 15 mm. and got married and moved to Oklahoma with her husband. And so I, I'm only bringing this up just because I do think it helps explain the years leading up to the girl's disappearance and what was considered to be normal and what was considered to be okay and the type of of life that they were living. Because it it really comes into like what we're getting ready to talk about. You said that um, her parents got divorced though, correct? Yes. And that happened a year previous to the disappearance? No, 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 no. It happened... It happened happened before that. Yeah, a long time ago. Okay. Yeah. No, it was Linda who moved, who got married and moved away the year prior to the disappearance. Yeah. The divorce happened several years ago. So um, Tammy, who was the youngest, was raised more by their stepfather Mm -hmm. than their actual father. Um, But their stepfather was also abusive. And I'm assuming that we're going to delve into the type of abuse that was uh, happening at the house. Yeah, so there was a lot of abuse happening just in general. At the house, um, the way Linda describes it, it just took the form of mainly emotional abuse and kind of harsh punishments. From stepdad. Uh, from stepdad and mom, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, And then their father when he was in the house. Yeah, it, I mean, if they like put their feet up on the coffee table, like it was, you know, they got the strap. It, it was, it was stuff like that. Um, very harsh punishments for very minor infractions. Yeah, inappropriate punishments. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, it doesn't sound like there was any sort of sexual abuse or anything like that going on. Okay, because that's where my mind went when you mentioned the age difference and the time, uh, or the age of mom when she got married was yeah, 14 right and then fast forward to the daughter is now 14 yeah well to me where i think that is more relevant um from the mom's perspective when tammy disappeared was she was thinking okay yeah she's she ran away whatever she's 14 because in her mind like that's, that's when, an adult that's basically. when she started her right adulthood, so yes. like it's not the way we look at it as a 14 year old being a child. Right. Yeah. No, that's just pedophiles have a tendency to, to stay in their same uh, age group and gender. So that was where I was going, uh, at least my initial thought. But uh, if, if that was not the case, then yeah, it doesn't seem like it was. Okay. In 1970, When Tammy was about eight years old, the Akers family moved to 404 Marshall Avenue in Roanoke. This home was right down the street from what they called the shop. The shop was a silk screening store that was owned by the Bramblett family. Earl Conrad Bramblett ran it with his father, who they called Old Man Bramblett. Tammy started hanging out at the shop. And Linda talks about this on her blog and says that she was super freaked out about it at first because her sister was eight and like they were at the laundromat or something. And, uh, and Linda just saw Tammy like talking to this old man in a store. To be fair, this sounds like the beginning of a Stephen King novel. (laughs) It does. (laughs) Um, but you know, so, so Linda went into the store and was like, Tammy, what are you doing? And Tammy swore that their mother said it was okay. 
And like Linda straight up did not believe her. She's like, there is no way. Like you are talking to this old man. You're alone. You're eight. Like there is no way that mom signed off on this. But eventually Linda found out that Tammy was telling the truth. And soon both girls started hanging out around the shop, earning a few dollars here and there for odd jobs like sweeping and folding t-shirts, things like that. Now, at this time, Linda was 13, and old man Bramblett was the dad. Um, Earl Bramblett was, you know, the son who uh, was the actual, like, owner of the business. Right. And Linda describes working for Earl at the shop like this, quote, The first time he brushed his hand over my rear, he said, excuse me. The second time, I slapped his hand away. It became the norm for me. I would help out at the shop, and while helping, he would interfere by accidentally brushing his hands over my body. He did this to my best friend, too, and we thought of it as a joke. I think we both got so used to this behavior that it became acceptable, end quote. Right. Yeah. And you said this is Earl. This isn't the old man. No, not old man. Yeah. Um, throughout all of this, did not hear anything about old man Bramblett. Um, apparently, he was just, you know. Old man. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Yeah. Everything centers around Earl. And when Linda wrote this as a 57-year-old woman, she recognized it for what it is, which is a pedophile grooming his victims. Normalizing unacceptable behavior. Exactly. Right? But at the time, as a 13-year-old girl in like 1970, it was just a workplace hazard. That's all. I mean, that's also why they prey upon victims that are that young and how they manipulate them, uh, you know, by by making behavior like that seem like it's okay. Yeah. It's just part of a day. It's, it doesn't lead to anything bigger. right? Right. And it's like kind of isolated. So when you're a victim in something like that, you just tend to second guess yourself. Like, did that actually happen? Did he, especially for that, especially at 13. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, this is such a universal experience that I think women and girls, like almost across the board, have had happen to them in one way or another at one time or another. And like it is, it's just, it's so subtle that even when it's, it happens over and over again, you're still just like, I don't, I don't know. Like, was that? bad like what what happened yeah it's it's so it's so hard to kind of wrap your mind around at that age and figure out like what you should do about it or if you should do anything about it and so you know i totally get what linda was saying like now again like i said as an adult she she sees it but not when you're 13 and not when you're in it and not when you don't have anyone in your life telling you that this is not okay right Yeah. This behavior continues for years. Once Linda is old enough to get a work permit at 14, she becomes an official employee, and Tammy continued to just kind of hang around and help out. But more than that, Earl's wife, Mary, seems to take a special interest in the now 10 year old. They would take her shopping, and she would even spend the night at their house sometimes, along with Mary's sisters. So at the time, Earl was around 30 and his wife, Mary, was around 19. So her sisters were like kids, basically. So this married couple just pretty much had kids hanging out around them all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when I read that part, I I instantly went to really Sherrod. Yeah. Right? Uh, Yes, exactly. Like what grown person wants to like have a kid spend the night at their house and buy them gifts and you know somebody that's practicing grooming behavior uh leading to a quote-unquote secret yeah and again echoing the realisha rudd case tammy's mom allowed this because to her earl was a father figure to tammy right she believed that he loved her like a daughter And it should be noted, though, that even Linda says that she never saw Earl touch Tammy inappropriately. But he did continue to molest her and her best friend, Yvonne. 
Linda even told her mother about Earl's wandering hands several times, apparently. But her mother, who again was married at 14 to a 31-year-old, didn't see this as a problem, and she thought that her daughter could handle herself. Manipulators like this choose their victims wisely, you know, Uh, and it's not just the victims that they choose. They choose basically the family. The family. Absolutely. They, they gain the trust of the parents. Uh, and it's typically parents that this type of behavior could be normalized Mm -hmm. or whatever, or they're just explained away. Yes. Or right. You know, and I mean, the unfortunate thing is that once it starts, it's hard to get out of it. Yeah. And it's true because, again, this all happens, starts in 1970. And by 1972, you know, they're all still involved in this. But at a Halloween party that year, Earl escalated. Linda doesn't get into details about what happened between her and Earl, but she does say on her blog, quote, I would have been raped if I had been alone with him, end quote. After that, Linda stopped working there, and she also tried to get her little sister to stop hanging out with Earl, but Tammy refused. Years pass, and nothing really untoward seems to happen between Tammy and Earl. She still hangs out with him. She trusted him and loved him like a father. Linda is still suspicious that something bad is happening there, but both Tammy and Earl deny it. And like I mentioned before, Linda got pregnant when she was 15, and she eventually moved away to Oklahoma. So even though she and Tammy remained close, like she wasn't there on a daily basis. To see any type of interaction. Exactly. Yeah. Shortly before Tammy's disappearance, though, Linda was home like the Christmas before um, the Christmas of 76. And Linda tried again to talk to her mom about it because like she was convinced that something was going on. And her mom said she was just jealous of Tammy. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) That is quite the dismissal. Yeah. Yeah. So all through the mid seventies, Tammy's hanging out with Earl but she's not the only one. Earl seemed to have no adult friends. He only hung out with children and teenagers, and they were constantly at his house. So when Tammy and Angela Rader became close, she fell into the same circle and also started working down at the shop. So that brings us to February 1977. Tammy and Angela were hanging out with each other all the time, and both girls were in Earl's orbit. Like I mentioned before, they had both been rebelling, and in addition to the truancy, according to Angela's mother, one or both of them had also been busted for shoplifting. Minor stuff. Again, low-level kind of teenage trouble. Right. And like I said, they had even run away together a couple of times before. Um, In 1997, Angela's mother, Dorothy Rader, told WDBJ Roanoke's CBS affiliate that she wasn't worried you know, immediately when the girls disappeared, saying, quote, at first I thought, well, she's come back and been found before, and of course she'll be found, end quote. So again, you know, I bring that up because it's not just coming from Tammy's family, right? Like Angela's family, who I know much less about, still was of the same mindset. Yeah, that they would just come back. Exactly. Yeah, which leads to probably less involvement from law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Um, well, especially when the family's not pushing for it at first. Right. Yeah. You know, well, and in the I days mean. and, you know, maybe weeks, I don't know, but definitely in the days following their disappearance, neither of the families was like, you know, banging down doors at the police station or anything like that. Right. Which is, which is bad for a missing person. Right. Because know. those first couple of days are critical, but right. if nobody considers them to be in danger, nobody's going to really look that hard. Yeah. And I, and I don't mean to keep dismissing the fact that it was 1977, but, uh, you know, things were different back then. Right. There isn't much information available about February 6th, the day before the girls disappeared, so I don't really know what they were doing or who they were hanging out with. But it sounds like the girls may have stayed the night at Angela's house, 
uh, that night, which was a Sunday, because the next morning, apparently Angela's sister drove them to school. At least that's like what's been reported a bunch, that Angela's sister drove both of the girls to school. This is the morning that they went missing. Yeah, when February they, when 7th. They didn't go to school. So we right. have Angela's sister mm-hmm. as the last known person to see them. Right. Well, officially. All of this is kind of in question. In that same WDBJ interview, Angela's mother says that the two girls spoke on the phone the night before the disappearance. So maybe they weren't together that night and and Angela's sister only drove her in. Mm. So I don't know. And Angela's mother also says that there was a third girl who was with both of the girls on the night of the 6th, but this girl has never been identified. So, you know, again, it's been 45 years. Yeah, sure. 44 years. And, you know, these interviews are done at different times and this, inter- you know, this information is compiled at different times. So I think some of the details get a little hazy. Right. But whether they arrived together or not, both girls did make it to William Ruffner Junior High School and were seen together by like other students that morning. Now, initial reports said that Tammy and Angela were later seen hitchhiking, but Angela's family says that this is untrue. According to the Help Find Angela Raider Facebook page, they were seen getting into a blue car driven by a man. The Raider family believes that this man led to the girl's disappearance. Mm. But backing up, no one at first thinks anyone led to the girl's disappearance other than the teens themselves. Right, yeah, because everybody's assuming they just ran away. Yeah, and that's probably why there isn't a whole lot of information about the early days of the investigation because there really wasn't one. And even when the girls didn't return in a few days or even a week or a month— while the family started to think something was wrong, the police still didn't seem too concerned. Tammy's mother, Helen Akers, called authorities every week for months in 1977, but received little information in return. However, her efforts did catch the eye of a local reporter who wrote an article in October of 1977, which was seemingly the first media coverage of the disappearance. And that was like eight months later. Yeah, so we don't have any information on initial investigation. Nope. We don't know if Earl was ever looked into. Mm -mm. We probably don't know what color car Earl was driving. No, the color car is interesting, but no, it was never mentioned if Earl had a blue car. And nobody was thinking of Earl at first. Like, Mm -hmm. nobody had any suspicions about him at all. Um, And it wouldn't be until three years later, in 1980 that the families would receive a word about a person of interest in Tammy and Angela's disappearance. In 1980, a group of teenagers attended a house party. At one point, the host of the party reportedly, quote, went crazy. He started crying and said that he wished he hadn't hurt Tammy because he loved her. He then pulled out a gun and started shooting at his wall. (laughs) The host of the party? Okay. Earl? Earl. Yeah. Yeah. So the kids at the party were understandably freaked out by this entire scene, so they ended up reporting it to police. Now, police, I think, were probably a little skeptical of this whole situation, but they checked it out. And when they went to Earl's house, there were bullet holes exactly where the teen said they would be. Bramblett denied having anything to do with either Tammy or Angela's disappearance, and police had no actual evidence. So while Earl became a person of interest in the case at this point, nothing beyond that really happened. But this is when the families were first made aware of Bramblett's possible involvement. Gotcha. Three years later. Mm -hmm. And the Raider family didn't even really know Earl Bramblett. Like, I mean, they knew that like Angela worked down there, but he just wasn't a part of their life in the way that he was a part of the Acres life. So like he was very far off of their radar. Yeah. Right. He was just, he was just their employer. Yeah. Like that. I'm sure that never crossed their mind. The Acres family, on the other hand, had a long history with the shop owner, 
And at least for Linda's part, though Earl hadn't been on her radar in terms of her sister's disappearance, she quickly became convinced after speaking with police and hearing about that party. And in fact, though no arrest would come for Earl Bramblett at that time, he wouldn't stay off police's radar for long. In 1984, he was arrested for molesting a 10-year-old girl, but the charges were eventually dropped. All right. So there we go. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it was just a matter of time. Then in 1993, after she gave an interview to a reporter that mentioned Earl's molestation of her when she was a child, Linda Owens ended up talking to police more officially about Earl Bramblett. She recorded a statement to police detailing the abuse in July of 1993 and even visited with a district attorney. She was hoping to help a few of Earl's other victims. Come forward. Exactly. Yeah, because I mean, I think at this point, the statute of limitations is out. Yeah, I mean, she said in her blog that it wasn't, but yeah, I can't imagine that it Uh, wasn't. Back then, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's still problems with statutes of limitations now, so. Yeah, so I don't know about that, but I mean, basically, she met with the district attorney, she did this recorded statement to police, but she said that the meeting with the DA went terribly, he was like super embarrassed by everything she was saying, and then she got embarrassed, and then she kind of just left and never followed up, and nothing happened Mm -hmm. and at the time linda had a 13 year old daughter and she was just like i don't want earl to like have a reason to come after me and come after my daughter you know so she just wanted to get away yeah that's fair i mean it's unfortunate and i uh, i can definitely understand the thought process behind yeah but um you know it's unfortunate that it couldn't have been handled better and that maybe this could have gotten the ball rolling on having more victims come forward. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, from what it sounds like, there definitely were a lot more victims, but Bramblett's luck would soon be running out on August 29th, 1994, a house fire broke out in Vinton, Virginia, which is just a few miles outside of Roanoke inside firefighters found a gruesome scene. 37-year-old Teresa Hodge's body was on a couch, still burning. She had also been strangled. Upstairs, they found 41-year-old William Hodges. He had been shot in the left temple, but not burned. A 22 with the barrel removed was next to him. Also upstairs were the bodies of the Hodges' daughters, 11-year-old Winter and 3-year-old Anna. They both had been shot. Initially, authorities believed that Hodges had murdered his family before shooting himself. He and, was act- and then removed the, the barrel. barrel. Yeah, so I want to talk to you about that in just a second. But like, it it makes sense initially because one, I mean, you know, murder victims, it's usually somebody close to you. Sure. And yeah. he was also about to start a six month sentence for embezzlement. So a lot of times when you have like a family annihilation case, there is some outside stressor, this inciting factor that kind of leads to it. So police looked at this and they thought, okay, he's about to go to prison for embezzlement. He murdered his family and shot himself. And then removed the barrel. Okay. Well, yes. So that's the thing. So further investigation revealed that the barrel of the gun had been removed after he was killed. And then they also somehow determined that he had been murdered first. And so I don't know about the. Yeah. So so I do want to talk about this, this like this, this barrel of the gun. I don't understand that. How do you even remove the barrel of a gun? Well, it depends on the type of the gun. It's a 22 pistol. I mean, is it? A revolver? Is it a semi-automatic? I'm assuming it's a semi-automatic. I don't know. It's 1994, three. Okay. I mean, those guns. 1994. Did, those guns did exist. They okay. Have, they have semi-automatics have been around since you know World War One. <laughs> so, um, I mean, yeah, you can remove a barrel. I, I, what I'm confused about is why it took further investigation. To discover that the barrel had been removed post-mortem? No, no. I think they always knew that the barrel was removed, but like they still thought that he had killed everybody. And then while the bullet was like bouncing around in his skull, he was like, I think I'll just take my gun apart. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. 
barrels don't just magically fall out of guns. Like you have to take the gun apart to get okay. the barrel out. So it's, it's like, I just, I don't understand how you would need further investigation to discover that the barrel had been removed from the gun. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Well, luckily, I mean, like I said, it didn't, it doesn't sound like it took them long to figure it out. Uh, okay. I mean, I would think <laughs> glancing around at the scene, you might notice that the gun's not in one piece. I'm not a detective, though. What do I know? Listen, and neither am I. So in addition to the barrel of the gun and somehow, I don't know how you would determine that he died first when everybody was murdered, like kind of around the same time. Right. But in any case, they also found that the phone lines had been disconnected and that the fire was an arson. So they found a flammable liquid had been dumped all over the house. Once they determined this, police started to widen the investigation into the Hodge family's death. So they decided to interview the family's close friend and boarder, Earl Bramblett. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is where we're leaving off this week. Dun, dun, dun. I know. Cliffhanger. Yeah. Um, so we still have a lot to talk about. We're going to obviously talk about, you know, the police's interview of Earl Bramblett when it comes to the Hodge family murders and how that really makes police and everyone really take a, a harder look at Earl. So, all right. But before we end for the week, I just wanted to, you know, chat with you and kind of get your impressions of where we are right now. So we have Earl Bramblett, you know, who the girls hung around, um, who claims to have loved Tammy like a daughter. Her sister, Linda, d did suspect that something more was going on there, but admits that she never saw anything happen. And then, you know, we have this party in 1980 where these kids say that he cried and said he wished he hadn't hurt Tammy. Like, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Where's Angela then? Right, exactly. Like, it's crazy to me that... Yeah, that he didn't, you know, go into, like, where Angela could be. Right. Yeah. So, I mean. Like, two I, girls I, disappeared. I guess, I guess maybe he had more of a relationship with Tammy. Yeah. I mean, he but, certainly did because, you know, he knew Tammy since she was eight. He wouldn't have met Angela till she was, like, 13. Yes. So, he definitely didn't have as much of a relationship with Angela. Yeah, but it's it is interesting to note that he only mentioned Tammy's name. Yeah. And not Angela. Yeah, but I have to imagine if something happened to Tammy, it had to have happened to Angela too. But maybe right? he, maybe he just doesn't regret. Well, what, yeah, maybe what he, he just doesn't Angela. care. Yeah, maybe yeah. like that's not something that I mean, he would cry about. This is also somebody that supposedly murdered an entire family. Right, right. So his, you know, his moral compass is not exactly centered. <laughs> Clearly. I mean, do you think there's any chance that in his, in this scenario that we're thinking of where he hurt Tammy, that Angela somehow got scared and ran away? I, I mean, sure, anything's possible, but it seems strange to me that if something was happening or did happen to Tammy, mm -hmm. that... Angela would run away and not seek help and still be like on her own, living her own life. 44 yeah. Four years, 44 later. years later. Right. I think it's, it's more likely that posturing a theory that he wanted to progress the relationship perhaps. And then things got uncomfortable or weird uh, mm -hmm. much in the same way that Linda mentioned that, she was at a party with him. Oh yeah. The Halloween party right. where she said she would have been raped right. had she been alone with him. So maybe he, maybe that's kind of his MO and he tried to do the same thing, mm -hmm. but Angela was also there and maybe there was some sort of confrontation. Mm. And that does make sense because like we said, Tammy has been in his life for so long and seemingly nothing terrible, you know, has happened up to this point. Yeah. And so, yeah, if, if he did hurt them, like what would have made things go so wrong? Yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe Angela intervened. Yeah. Maybe and then everything went South. Mm -hmm. Next week, we're going to pick up right where we left off and talk about the 
quadruple murder in Vinton that the police end up questioning Earl for. And we're going to talk about what happens to him, what he says after he goes to prison. Mm, Okay. Because he's got theories of his own about what happened to Tammy. Oh, all right. And apparently they don't involve him doing anything. So we'll talk about all of that. Um, and we're also going to talk about theories with Angela, which are actually separate, and a new possible huge break in the case that just happened last summer in 2020. All right. I'm looking forward to it. I know. It's going to be good. So thank you guys for sticking with us for this. Sorry about the cliffhanger, but we are going to come back to you right next week with the ending of Angela Rader and Tammy Akers. So we will see you next week. See you next week. You can see all of the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And then they were gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!